and welcome to week 9's lectures on the Moonstone. In today's uh, session, I'll be discussing um, the plot in detail and I will finish up by uh, talking a little bit about the idea of the female Gothic. Now, uh, let me complete the line of thought uh, that I was uh, discussing with you in the previous uh, lecture. Uh, these ideas are from um, the writer Karen Levy and um, the ideas uh, talk about uh, or give further context or um, give a, a, a greater uh, perspective on the kind of narrative uh, that is in the novel The Moonstone. To reinforce his role as editor, not to say curator of the narratives, Blake appends a series of footnotes to the text. In a memorable exchange, Clack takes umbrage with him within these notes about the difficulty of narrating without providing the benefits of her insights and her natural wish to improve the reader. Her hindsight is eventually silenced, but not before she affectionately reminds Mr. Blake that she is a Christian and that it is therefore quite impossible for him to offend her. In the previous um, session, we were talking about uh, Miss Clark and how Collins was very proud of that uh, characterization. Uh, now, uh, Blake has uh, taken his role as editor very, very seriously. In fact, he often uh, provides footnotes to the text. And in one of these footnotes, we see that Clark is uh, not very happy with the kind of advice that Blake uh, provides her. That is, he asks her not to assess events um, in retrospect, in hindsight, and she responds by saying that um, he cannot uh, really offend her because she's a Christian and therefore, uh, you know, it, she has a, such a broad mind and, and is extremely tolerant and um, other things. So uh, what is important here is the fact that the narratives are uh, documents almost and uh, there are uh, notes to these documents indicating that everything has been collected and put together uh, with almost a scientific um, method. As if to reverse the narrator's aspect relationship, the light of suspicion falls on Franklin himself for the last part of the novel, an unspoken love surfaces in the story of Rosanna Spearman, a former servant within the Verinda household, who nursed a hidden affection for Franklin, seeking to protect his good name and avoid his implication of the theft of the diamond, she changes the course of events, introducing a new direction. Franklin himself is suspected in the final section of the novel and we're also told that uh, there is a, an ex-servant in the Verinda household who was in love with Franklin and apparently in order to protect him she um, she offers uh, information uh, very subtly in such a way that um, the uh, suspicion doesn't fall on Franklin. As the story draws to a close, we learn the true journey of the diamond. Uh, bit part characters emerge to entertain and make revelations against the background of the continuing presence of Indian men in London. The conduct of an experiment carried out by Ezra Jennings, Lady wearing this uh, doctor, and involving the use of opium, a further theme permits the reenactment of the evening of Rachel's party and the disappearance of the stone. What we uh, need to uh, remember here is that uh, the Indian men constantly haunt the, the streets of London uh, in an attempt to recover that uh, stone and uh, further that there is an experiment that is carried out to uh, prove the way in which um, the crime uh, had happened uh, to kind of uh, uh, recreate the incident of the crime. The selection of characters chosen to tell the story of the diamond can feel arbitrary but also gives the book its charm, spinning out the mystery. The forensic exploration is as much into society and human weaknesses as it is into the loss of the diamond. The charm about Moonstone is its array of um, characters who are entrusted with this um, 
massive responsibility of telling the tale. Uh, in fact, the choice of the characters may seem arbitrary um, without apparent kind of um, uh, uh, logic into their choice, but um, uh, that's what gives this uh, novel its great uh, effect. And um, the novel does a kind of a forensic examination into the values and uh, into the um, ethos of the society and uh, human weakness is laid bare as much as the um, loss of the diamond and attempts to recover it. Now, so far we have seen um, the importance of Moonstone uh, from a very general uh, but uh, also a very particular uh, perspective that is the point of view of narrative style. Um, the critics that I have um, mentioned so far have uh, uh, emphasized on uh, the narrative structure of this novel. Now I'm going to give you uh, a detailed um, plot summary of The Moonstone. The Moonstone is a magnificent yellow diamond large as a plover's egg. It was looted at the siege of uh, Seranga Patnam in southern India in 1799 by Colonel John Hearn Castle, who seized it from the forehead of a Hindu god. On his return to England, he was ostracized by his family and society, and in revenge for a slight, he leaves the diamond set to carry a curse to his niece, Rachel Veranda. Rachel's cousin, Franklin Blake, is to deliver the diamond to the Veranda house near Frizzing Hall on the Yorkshire coast. Uh, some of the details uh, here are already familiar. We know that John Herncastle stole the diamond from India, uh, in fact, from the forehead of a god uh, in, during the fall of Sri Rangapatnam in uh, southern India. And because he was slighted and ostracized, um, excluded from his family and society, he wanted to take revenge on them. And what he does is he leaves the diamond to his uh, niece. He gives it to his niece, Rachel Verinda, and um, the cousin, Franklin Blake, is to uh, give it to her. The important uh, point here is that, that this diamond carries a curse. It will affect anybody who possesses it. The moonstone is presented to Rachel at a dinner party for her 18th birthday. The guests include Godfrey Abelwhite, another cousin, Mr. Candy, the family doctor, Mr. Marth Wade, a celebrated traveler in India, and Drusilla Clark, an interfering evangelist. The party goes badly. Rachel and Franklin Blake have become fond of each other while decorating her sitting room and Rachel had earlier refused a marriage proposal from Abel White. So there is uh, an attempt at engagement uh, between um, Rachel and uh, Abel White and it doesn't come through. Um, but we also realize that a romance is budding between um, Franklin Blake and uh, Rachel Verinda. So these are some of the uh, events that initiate the plot of the Moonstone. In addition, Blake quarrels with Mr. Candy about the competence of doctors. Blake had been followed in London and Marthwaite identifies three Indians seen near the house as uh, high caste Brahmins. Uh, Rachel places the diamond in her bedroom cabinet but the next morning it is missing. You can see why the uh, party has gone wrong. Abel White is not able to secure an engagement with Rachel and Blake quarrels with the doctor, Mr. Candy, and uh, there is also information that Blake had been followed by uh, three Indians, high caste Brahmins, and uh, the next day, um, the diamond, which is secured in Rachel's cabinet, goes missing. The local police superintendent, Seagrave, is a bungling incompetent, so Blake calls in the celebrated Sergeant Cuff of the detective police. He, reels, uh, he rules out the suspicious Indians, but realizes the importance of uh, smeared paint on Rachel's sitting room door. 
The smear has been made by an article of dress whose owner is almost certainly the thief. Rachel behaves inexplicably, obstructing the investigation and refusing to have anything more to do with Franklin Blake. The initial police superintendent is uh, dismissed and in his place, Sergeant Cobb, the very famous uh, and celebrated uh, detective, is brought to the household to throw light on the mystery. Uh, he doesn't think the Indians have uh, stolen it, but there is a clue left on the room door. There is a smudge made by paint, and that paint uh, is most likely to have come from an article of dress. And they assume that the person wearing that outfit would have um, most likely stolen the diamond. And what is most interesting is the fact that Rachel be uh, behaves in a very uh, illogical, um, unreasonable and inexplicable manner. And she doesn't want to assist in the investigation. And she doesn't want to also do anything with Franklin Blake. They have been very friendly uh, during the party, but now she doesn't want to do anything with him. Cuff concludes that she has stolen her own diamond, assisted by Rosanna Spearman, a deformed housemaid fascinated by the local quicksand. Rosanna is a reformed thief who is acquainted with a dubious London moneylender, Septimus Luker. She is also in love with Franklin Blake and after acting strangely, drowns herself in the shivering sand. Cuff is dismissed from the case by Lady Verinda, but correctly predicts future developments. Cuff assumes that it is Rachel herself who has uh, stolen her own diamond and she had been assisted in that act by her maid, uh, a housemaid called Rosanna Spearman. Rosanna had once been a thief uh, but she is reformed now and she also has associations with a dubious London moneylender called Luker. We also realized that uh, Rosanna Spearman is also uh, very much in love with Franklin Blake and she knows that it cannot come to anything and therefore she drowns herself, kills herself. Cuff is uh, dismissed by Lady Verinda. In London, both Abel White and Luca are attacked and searched, Luca losing a receipt for a great valuable. Lady Verinda dies of a heart condition and Rachel reluctantly agrees to marry Abel White whose father has become her guardian. They move to Brighton where they are visited by Mr. Brough, the family solicitor. The engagement is broken off when he reveals that Abel White is in debt and is marrying Rachel for her money. Abel White, if you remember, is also one of um, the cousins to Rachel. And uh, Abel White and Luca, the moneylender, were attacked and searched in London. And Luca, um, in the process, loses a receipt for a, a great uh, item, a priceless item. Lady Verinda is no more, and Rachel is um, uh, forced to uh, get engaged to Abel White. Uh, whose father is her guardian now and uh, they moved to Brighton uh, and in Brighton they're visited by the family uh, lawyer called Mr. Bruff and he tells her that Abel uh, White is in great debt and he is marrying Rachel not for love but for her money. Blake returns from travels abroad but Rachel refuses to see him. Determined to restore her good opinion, he revisits Yorkshire where Rosanna Spearman's only friend, Limping Lucy, gives him a letter from the dead uh, housemaid. This leads him to the shivering sand where Rosanna has hidden his nightgown, smeared with paint with a confession that she concealed the nightgown and killed herself out of love. Blake, in, uh, Blake uh, Franklin Blake, who is back uh, in England, wants to uh, see Rachel, but she refuses to uh, see him. Uh, he is determined to make up for any uh, slides, any offense that he had caused unwittingly, and he visits Yorkshire, where uh, he meets with Limping Lucy, another uh, uh, person who is uh, specially um, uh, challenged. And uh, she, Limping Lucy, uh, gives um, the letter from uh, dead, uh, from the now dead Rosanna to him, and um, 
that letter leads him to the shivering sand where he realizes that his own nightgown is hidden by Rosanna's spearman and that nightgown has a smudge of paint and he also finds a letter in which she con uh, confesses that he uh, had uh, that she had killed herself because of um, uh, because of love towards uh, Franklin Blake. The confused Blake returns to London and contrives a meeting with Rachel at Mr. Bruff's house in Hampstead. There she tells him that she knows he had financial problems and with her own eyes saw him take the diamond. Her own actions have been to protect his reputation. We now see that somehow um, there is a meeting contrived between Franklin Blake and Rachel at the solicitor's house in Hampstead and uh, she declares to him that she saw with her own eyes that uh, Blake stole the diamond, took the diamond and she also tells him that she is aware that he had financial problems and therefore uh, his actions seem uh, logical and in fact, um, you know, the she had been trying all along to protect his reputation by not actively assisting in the investigation. Blake meets Mr. Candy's assistant, Ezra Jennings, who saved Candy's life from a fever caught after the birthday dinner. Jennings had recorded Candy's delirium, which revealed that Candy had secretly given Blake opium to prove his point in their argument. Blake therefore unknowingly stole the diamond under the influence of the drug in order to keep it safe. Now we have come to the point where we get uh, further revelations in the story. Uh, Blake meets uh, Ezra Jennings who is assistant to Mr. Uh, Candy, the doctor uh, with whom Blake had an argument during the birthday party and uh, Jennings had helped Ezra Jennings recover from a fever and during that fever Candy had been delirious and he confessed to or he uh, let out that he gave opium to Blake under um, uh, the effect of opium he uh, that is Franklin Blake stole the diamond so we realized that Blake was in fact the one who took the diamond but he didn't know it himself because he was under the influence of the drug and he did it to keep it safe. Jennings explains to Blake that if he takes opium again under similar conditions, he may repeat his actions of the previous year and reveal where he placed the diamond. Blake agrees and the experiment is conducted with Mr. Bruff as an observer. Blake takes a substitute gem but fails to reveal the Moonstone's hiding place. Rachel, really in love with him, is also present and has already forgiven him. So as you can see, there is a reconstruction of that day, um, the night after the birthday dinner, and uh, Blake is given opium again, and under the observation of Mr. Ruff, um, Blake, the uh, drugged Blake, uh, does successfully take a replacement gem uh, from the camera, but he is unable to um, tell where uh, he had hid it. And Rachel now realizes that um, Franklin Blake is guiltless and is in love with him again and she has forgiven him. Bruff in the meantime has Lucas Bank watched. The money lender is observed passing the diamond to a sailor who is followed to a dockside inn. Later the same night he is murdered. Cuff Brought out of retirement by Blake, discovers that the sailor is Godfrey Abelwhite in disguise. He was the real thief and stole the gem to save himself from financial ruin. He has been killed by the Indians who have now recovered the diamond. In a religious ceremony witnessed in India by Marthwaite, the Brahmins return the diamond to the god of the moon. Mr. Braff, the, uh, the lawyer, um, has the bank of that money lender, Luca, uh, watched. The money lender gives the diamond to a sailor uh, who is um, followed to an inn. And we realize that the sailor is murdered uh, on the same night. Cuff um, comes back to the scene. He is brought back from his retirement by Blake. And we realize that um, the sailor is uh, 
uh, none other than Godfrey Abelwhite in disguise. Abelwhite is the one who was uh, really in uh, financial distress and uh, he had been the one who had stolen the gem to save himself from debt and he had been killed by the Indians when they tried to recover the diamond from him. And we realize we are told that um, the Brahmins have returned the diamond to its rightful place and uh, they've uh, given it back to the god of the moon. Now, let's talk about... Uh, the idea of the female Gothic. Now, from this point on, I'm going to talk about um, the ideas of uh, Dr. Tamar Heller uh, from her book, Dead Secrets, uh, Wilkie Collins and the Female Gothic. The actual quotations are from a review by Winifred Hughes. The critical model that Tamar Heller develops in her study of Wilkie Collins might be called one of rivers and anxiety of influence. Her scenario for his career depicts the best-selling male author routinely dismissed by contemporaries as a popular sensationalist, struggling to come to grips with a disreputable matrilineal inheritance. What Winifred Hughes in her review of um, the critical work points out is that there is a reverse anxiety of influence according to Tamar Heller's assessment uh, that is, contemporaries of Wilkie Collins had uh, uh, dismissed Collins saying that he was just a sensationalist and we are reminded of Wilkie Collins, The Woman in White, the best uh, uh, sensational novel of all times. And um, what she is arguing is that Collins um, is trying to come to terms with the much lineal inheritance of the uh, mode of Gothic and crime narrative. So uh, one can see him struggling with that uh, plot that had been handed to him by um, writers such as Anne Radcliffe. In Heller's reading of Collins's fiction, it's a recurrent image of women's buried writing, most famously Rosanna Spearman's transgressive love letter sunken beneath the quicksand in that uh, encodes the submerged tension between Collins's allegiance to the genre of female gothic and his desire for the prestige of literary professionalism and masculine authority. In other words, uh, the essence here is that there is a friction, a conflict between literary professionalism associated with male authority, um, male supremacy, and um, the genre of the female gothic. In fact, uh, what is uh, clear from this kind of criticism is that uh, Collins is resisting the female Gothic, um, but inevitably the the power of the female Gothic resurfaces in his uh, writing. And um, the key event that is pointed out by uh, Tamar Heller is the um, the suicide of Rosanna Spearman, particularly the submergence of the transgressive love letter. It's a transgressive love letter because a servant is not supposed to fall in love with a, a master figure, with a man from the nobility. And Rosanna Spearman does that, and, and that, that therein lies the transgression. So that uh, transgression is submerged. Uh, literally and metaphorically in the narrative by Collins and it resurfaces it's uh, the idea comes back to the surface uh, to be uh, read by readers so there is transgression there so there is a gothic element there in relation to Rosanna Spearman she is a lower class character she is a reformed thief and um, her uh, um, courage in falling in love with uh, Franklin Blake is extraordinary and um, and it makes sense within the logic of the female gothic narrative. What emerges most unmistakably from Heller's account is Collins' unresolved and ultimately unresolvable ambivalence. No matter how hard he may have tried to contain the troublesome gothic influence, literally locking up and hiding away his female character's subversive text, it keeps resurfacing in his fiction and undermining or at least qualifying his attempts to legitimate the position of the male artist. We see that the detective fiction 
where we have a male detective as essentially uh, a male's domain. The detective can also be uh, perceived as a male artist. He is in control of his ground. He uh, explains things logically. He harnesses the clues and explains um, and, and uh, uh, throws light on every mystery. So that's one way to look at uh, the detective narrative. However, there is also resistance to this kind of detection in the moonstone and that comes through um, in the figures of even racial verinda she resists investigation for reasons of her own and she uses rosanna spearman and she also has her own reasons for resisting uh, detection so all these are very very important uh, uh, events and tendencies on the part of the female uh, characters so there are a lot of subversion to a male uh, reading of narratives, a male a reading of events. No matter how hard he may have tried to quell the impulse of rebellion and to silence the primarily female voice of protest, he could not help identifying with his outcast and uh, marginalized characters. As Heller sees it, Wilkie Collins' own secret in novels obsessed with secrets is the unacknowledged but informing presence of the female gothic. There is a tendency on the part of detective fiction to quell uh, rebellion, to, um, to make rebellion um, be disciplined, to um, destroy the nature of rebellion. We can see rebellion, especially as I pointed out earlier in Racial Verinda. She resists Blake, she resists Abel White as well to um, a certain extent. And um, this female voice of protest is, um, is pushed into a corner uh, by detective fiction, uh, by this kind of narrative. And that female voice of protest can be seen as a gothic tendency. Um, and there is an attempt uh, on the part of Collins in uh, The Moonstone to silence that voice of protest. Nevertheless, even though he is uh, attempting to silence it, he is also identifying, he is also sympathizing with his outcast and marginalized characters. We can see that coming through uh, in his characterization of Rosanna Spearman. Uh, all these minor characters do get their moment in uh, um, limelight. We see uh, Rosanna Spearman's um, letter where she confesses that that letter is uh, brought to the surface it's read by everybody and we have uh, the limping lucy um uh, speak with uh, franklin uh blake so all these marginalized characters do come to the surface do come to the fore in collins's fiction and Collins, as we know, is obsessed with secrets. Secrets are a key um, attribute of Gothic fiction. And um, when, when secrets proliferate in the seductive fiction, we realize that uh, Wilkie Collins is uh, massively indebted to um, the narrative of the female Gothic, the tradition of the female Gothic, which celebrates this kind of um, plotting. Behind Collins's radical social themes and his critique of bourgeoisie ideology, Heller finds an underlying anxiety about the ambiguous class and even gender status of the Victorian writer. Focusing on the self-reflexive dimension of Collins's fiction, Heller reads his preoccupation with artist figures as a working out of his own protracted search for both masculine and artistic identity. Several things are um, illustrated in this um, set of ideas. Firstly, we realize that Collins does deal with um, radical social themes in his own way through the narrative of crime, through uh, a gothic um, exploration of certain um, ideas, and he does criticize bourgeoisie ideology. Uh, what Heller uh, finds in her assessment of uh, Collins is that uh, Collins has an ambiguous attitude, uh, 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 a kind of a, uh, a complex response to class and gender status 
of, of the Victorian writer. Um, the Victorian writer is a professional, but he also makes money out of his writing. So you can see that ambiguity in that position of the writer. And um, Collins also does criticize the stifling um, tendencies of uh, class regulations. For example, we can think about uh, the suicide of Rosanna Spearman. And uh, what we understand is that Collins himself is, um, um, is, is in, a, in, a, in a quandary in terms of his own position as well as um, in terms of the artist figures that we see in his uh, fiction because both the artist figures and Collins himself are uh, in search for an identity that's both masculine and artistic and he wants to kind of repel um, and, and uh, get away from anything that has uh, a feminine aura to it and uh, what is interesting is that the crime narratives um, that he produces have that um, tendency to be associated with women in fact it is a matrilineal inheritance that he is working with in his uh, writings which are about crime and secrets and mystery and gothic attributes Thank you for watching. I'll continue in the next session.